Hi, good evening to everyone. I'm Dr. Philip McMillan. Thank you for joining me again. And last week, I had a discussion with Gert van den Bosch, who is an expert in vaccine development, immunology, virology. And I've been speaking with him since 2021. And he anticipated this very unusual pattern in the pandemic where we will have ongoing um, viral variants. And he clearly links this as far as he's concerned based on his research to mass vaccination. So our first video was in 2021 and he was proved cor completely correct. What's more concerning is that he is looking out or he is very concerned about Hivicron. Now it may appear to look as though it's something to do with HIV but it isn't. What it means is highly virulent Omicron variant. And so I'll be talking about this and giving an update on this um, based on a, a further document that he sent in the week, as well as my reflections when speaking with uh, Dr. Rob Renenbaum. So before I start, I'll just give a couple of updates that I want you to look at in the description. The first thing that you have to do is to remember to subscribe. Please click on the subscribe link at the bottom. Join us in this journey of research. And I've got here an image to do with Humming Heroes. And Humming Heroes is a project that we had been working on with regards to our Kickstarter program. It was a successful Kickstarter program, and we therefore were able to publish this remarkable book in conjunction with Lumientia, and we have got it now ready. It's going to be prepared for a launch on Amazon, hopefully within a few weeks time. And what we want is people who are interested to register the link below. Now, just to make it clear, this is quite an interesting book because what we did is not just a story, but incredible pictures that we use and the storyline. And um, under every section here is the bit where we try and explain the science about what is going on. So it's a combination of science storytelling to capture a very important principle about nitric oxide. This is quite a remarkable book, and uh, certainly we want it to do well on Amazon. So please remember to register at the link that's below so you can join us in that. And you can see this is what it would look like if you go to Macmillan Research. You can register to join us there. So um, we hope, look forward to seeing you on this journey. Uh, the second update that I want to mention about is that coming up is part two of my advanced COVID 360. I'm capturing all the research I've been doing. Join us there. There's a link. There are some free tickets, donation and paid tickets available. Jump in, get registered, join us. You'll be involved in the question and answer. And more importantly, it, what it means is that we've got the pre-launch in place. So this is now ready. The first stage has been put together. It is there. It's at a significantly discounted price because we want people to join in with us and learn more about it while we build the whole course. This is going to end up being more than 30 modules um, at the end. So join us again. The links are in the description. So remember to subscribe and remember to support. So let's get back to what we're talking about with GERT. This is a big topic. And quite frankly, when I had the conversation with GERT, he did put a timeline. I hate timelines because it is so difficult to know exactly when things are going to happen. And I had highlighted to him that when he had a timeline at the beginning of the pandemic, the thought as to when these variants would occur was quite soon. But in reality, people didn't realize what was going on until about 18 months after the vaccination program when we started to see all these variants of Omicron. And you realize that there is a problem here and exactly what he had predicted was coming true. But the timeline is difficult to predict. However, there's a reason 
when I spoke with uh, Dr. Renenbaum, and again, the full one and a half hour discussion, we sat down yesterday and we went through everything, talking about the immune system, breaking it down, trying to make sense of everything. So this was ex very valuable for me, and it has helped me to put together some slides to help to try and explain a little bit more about what Gert is saying. Critically, I think he's right. That's the conclusion that I came to at the end. And we were discussing some of the clinical scenarios. And in fact, what I realized is this is already happening. It's just not at a scale that people are aware of. And therefore, it seems as though it's not. So in reality, this is pretty serious stuff. There is no easy way out of this. And it has huge implications for mortality. But we'll come back to that in just a second. And so what we had done, uh, myself and Rob, as I said, is we went through his presentation again. And um, just to remind those people who hadn't seen it last week, um, I'll just show you basically the, the summary of the picture that he used in the presentation. And it was looking here at what was the transition of the pandemic. And so he had started here with the Wuhan lineage from China, well, um, from Wuhan, then it spread more infectious variants, then you got Omicron, then he was talking about the antibodies, the more infectious uh, Omicron descendants, vaccine breakthrough infections, then the involvement of cytotoxic uh, T lymphocytes, and then when they hit down here, a broadly cross-reactive polyneutralizing antibodies, then this occurs, a Hivicron, which is what he describes as a highly virulent Omicron variant. Now, as I said, when we went through it in detail, I realized that, goodness gracious, this is probably true. And so my question was, what are the clinical impl implications? How will this present? And so for those who are wise and recognize that we have uh, serious problems in front of us, and what you have is leadership that will not acknowledge any mistakes that they have made. So even if they've made a mistake, as far as they're concerned, it seems that they would rather serious implications to occur rather than acknowledging a mistake. If those are the kind of leadership that you have, I would suggest that you have to change them very quickly if you want to be able to make progress as societies. And I remember hearing the story of, um, I have I meant to confirm it, but when um, World War II had started, and um, I think that some of the politicians had highlighted the risks around Hitler, um, but it was put pushed back in the UK, when it turned out to be true, the members of parliament who had stood against doing anything stepped down. And this was just a matter of conscience that they realized that their position was untenable. I don't know if we have that kind of leadership any at this time, because we really need to come up with new strategies at the moment, if vaccines are unable to stop it, pa Paxlovid is no longer able to demonstrate that it's working, certainly not in the vaccinated cohort. We know that remdesivir can only reduce uh, hospital length of stay and not necessarily mortality. They have nothing left in the basket. The only thing that is around are things that have been derided for the past three years. Will they be humble enough to step back and say, listen, we apologize, we have nothing to lose, or will they just leave it? What seems to be happening is that we have a situation where there is more and more news about this highly virulent H1N1 uh, bird flu. I think that they would rather everyone think that was the problem than acknowledge that a Hivicron could actually be occurring and is going to carry with it serious mortality implications. So we appreciate Gert, and the reason why he put a timeline on it when I spoke with Rob is that he, Rob said, he thinks that Gert is willing 
to be ridiculed for getting the time wrong. But if he thought this was urgent, he would say it because you had to do something in order to prevent it from occurring or to reduce the implications. So getting back to what he put out this week is that subsequent to the, um, to the discussion, he highlighted a point here. I've learned that the virus had to slow down its spread and is now awaiting rising temperatures to be able to select a highly virulent lineage. He's clearly saying this is not correct. And he's pointing out that with each new wave of vaccine breakthrough infections, viral transmission slows down as a result of immune refocusing. I'm going to highlight what that is about in a minute. And then the delayed emergency of the coronavirus lineage capable of causing vaccine breakthrough trans infections facilitates prolonged viral spread. And later on, he goes into this image, um, which is predicting what he thinks is just about to happen. And again, I say, I hope he is wrong. But the more that I looked at the science, I realized that he probably was right. What do we do? That's the bigger question. But first, we need leaders who are willing to try and do something different or else the world is stuck. So I'm going to share with you a few slides that came out of my thoughts on that discussion. And, um, and then I'll go back to what Gert was saying. And so let me just get this ready and I'll, I'll show you what I had thought. Uh, put together a few slides on this just to get some ideas together. So again, I always start with the coronavirus structure. And you can see here, and this ball gray thing is the envelope. Well, this is the, the layer, lipid layer of the virus. On the surface, you have these blue dots, which are spike proteins. And then on the top of it, you have as well M proteins, membrane proteins, and envelope proteins. In natural immunity, it develops immunity to every one of these, including the nuclear capsid. So this is why natural immunity tends to be broader than uh, vaccine-induced um, systemic immunity, which is targeting just the spike protein. This is what Gert said was the issue because it was not going to stop a highly mutating virus from spreading. So that's the picture of the virus. Next, I then captured an image just to give you a 3D idea as to what it would probably look like. And so I found this was a nice image. And again, you can see on the surface all these dots, the envelope and the M protein, and then you have these spike proteins on the surface. So there are multiple spike proteins dotted all over this virus. And this is what it looks like. And any one of the spike proteins can bind to ACE2 and therefore cause it to get inside the cell and then replicate into thousands or millions of viral particles. So every one of these is a key that can open the lock to a cell that has ACE2 on it. So again, another slice, and I'm showing you here a spike protein. This is a sideways view of it. This is actually the receptor binding domain section here. And it would just embed itself into this um, layer of lipids of the virus. And inside is where the RNA is kept, which is then going to make multiple other viruses. So this is just the standard picture. Then what I showed here is that I then sat down and thought about what really does this look like? And so... I went and looked at the size of the spike protein, and it's about 540 kilodaltons. So it's three, um, it's almost three spike proteins together wrapped around an S2 segment, and each one is about 140. So it has actually three points on it that can connect to ACE2. So it's quite sophisticated, and then it flips between the open and close. These are some of the things I mentioned in the in the advanced course. So if you want more about that, please join it. I've added in here the IgG antibody. An IgG antibody is about 150 kilodaltons, so it's about a third of the size of it. 
um, in terms of the spike protein. And I found this was very important because it made me understand a little bit more about what Gert had been saying. Then I've got here a picture of what the spike protein would look like. This is again another spike protein. And on the surface of it, you have now these antibodies. And this now represented in my mind a closer approximation in size as to what would happen. Because one of the things uh, Gert had always said is that the antibodies then block the ability for other antibodies to bind to the spike protein. And that's part of the reason why you can't get proper neutralization of the virus with these non-neutralizing antibodies because they're not binding properly to the receptor binding domain. And then I have here another picture, which now I imagine that same virus I'd shown you before with all these multiple antibodies stuck all over the surface of it. And this is what Gert is saying, is actually making the virus more infectious because it's keeping the spike protein in the open position where it can bind to ACE2, and it's not neutralizing the virus because guess what? A lot of these antibodies are going to be IgG4. So this is the, the breakdown in terms of an image that I thought would be valuable in order to try and understand what was going on. So now I'm going to take you to an important paper. And this paper is what I used to understand about the neutralizing antibodies. So here you have this paper. This was late 2023, and it was looking at neutralization escape for the Omicron subvariant BA 2.86. This is the forerunner to JN1, which is now dominating the world. And what Gert is saying, he's expecting there is going to be another variant pretty soon that is going to be highly virulent beyond even what JN1 is. And so this is what the next subvariant he's worried about. And he thinks, again, in a very short period of time, this is going to occur. The reason that that paper was important is because of this bit in it when it looked at the uh, antibody titers. So what this is highlighting here is that you have the Wuhan strain 2020 and then you have the BA286 strain. And then in between you have all these Omicron variants, BA125, XBB15, XBB116 and so on. And they're all in different colors. And part of the problem is that the biggest antibody is to the Wuhan variant, and this is 16,172. You compare that to the antibodies to the BA286, which they were testing for, that only has 300. And then the body is producing all these other antibodies targeting viruses that are no longer here. And this is where Gert was talking about the immune refocusing. After each one, the um, virus then focuses in, produces more. This is for BA2, then it produces for BA, um, um, BA5, and then XBB15. And it's producing all these antibodies because the immune system has to refocus every single time that you're having these breakthrough infections. And so when we think about that, and now I'll take you back to that image that I had before, is that when you then think about it in this context, all of these, you will now have probably about 15 different types of antibodies binding on spike proteins, but not blocking the receptor binding domain. This is now the situation that Gert is saying is occurring in the highly vaccinated population. And so I'll come now to his presentation or his most recent update. And in this, he says that highly vaccinated societies are going to be caught off guard. And so here we have uh, the situation here. And this is where he says societies in highly COVID-19 vaccinated countries will be caught off guard because he's saying they are not expecting this to occur. We are coming into the summer period there normally is less circulation of virus. This is not usually an issue. He highlights here the immune escape that has been occurring over time. So you have increased prevalence of severe COVID-19 at this point, but then you're having immune escape. 
Then you had this SIR, which he calls um, steric immune refocusing. So the breakthrough infection, the immune system responds, and then it controls transmission for a bit. Then it escapes again. And now he says the next step you have is cellular immune refocusing. This is where he talked about the cytotoxic T lymphocytes because the antibodies are no longer working. So it's triggering the last line of defense, which we discussed in our presentation with Rob. So then you have again more immune refocusing around these uh, cytotoxic lymphocytes. All of this is adding in the delay. You then have the immune escape again. This is where the highly virulent um, Omicron comes in. And then he says you get to this point here, which is SIS or steric immune silencing. In effect, what he's saying here is the immune response is no longer going to be able to respond to this variant. And this is therefore what is going to be the cause of this very severe phase of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, there are many people who think this is over, and that's okay. And let's hope they're right, because as I said, there is no benefit for anybody in this, because even though the unvaccinated are protected against this variant, because their immune system largely is, is now able to identify any variant the virus produces, if you have a situation in highly vaccinated regions where lots of people get sick, it's going to damage every aspect of society, you know, and transportation, uh, food production. You know, I, I mean, there is no benefit to anyone. That's the reality. So we have a situation where no one is going to benefit if this occurs. But it seems as though the powers that be are not even doing a risk assessment on this. They're not even listening to what he's saying. It's kind of like they're saying this cannot happen. Now, why would you say that with a guy who has tremendous expertise and was proved right already? I mean, goodness gracious, you know, it's one thing to say, well, I don't think that's going to happen. But risk assessment means you say, I don't think it's going to happen, but let's put in place something in case this occurs. And that's the critical bit that is not occurring. Leadership across the world is just sitting on their hands because they have run out of options. And what they had said before is no longer as if, well, no longer effective. You have to, again, every time I speak, I talk about this elephant because this elephant is serious. And this elephant is going to do great damage if we don't acknowledge it. One of the problems with the elephant now is the sad part is that even if we acknowledge the elephant at this late stage, is there anything that can be done that is going to make a huge difference to what is likely to occur? So in the presentation with Rob, and again, the link is in the description, there's one and a half hours. In the last half an hour, if you don't want to go through all of the, the science, we then try and piece together what we think are the clinical implications. How will it present? What will it look like when patients get sick? Is it going to be more like a subacute COVID? Who is going to be affected? Is it just primarily initially the frail, the old people, people with comorbidities? Will it affect younger people with natural immunity? How will it affect those who have had natural immunity and then were vaccinated versus those who are vaccinated before natural immunity? It's, it, it's that kind of question that is very, very difficult to predict in terms of clinical presentation. All we know is this. We are coming to this stage, as Gert has predicted, where there is no longer immunity left. The immune system in this cohort of patients, which is likely to be very big, is not going to be able to respond. They will have what we would describe as disseminated viral sepsis. How does that present? We don't know because we've never seen it in the context of COVID-19. Even in the immune suppressed, I think that they have not had this disseminated sepsis that we seem as though we're going to have. The only way out is to stop transmission 
as much as possible immediately. How can we do that when every one of the standard antivirals that they have been promoting can't do it? They have to go back to the drawing board. They have to apologize like the FDA did about the mistakes they made with criticizing horse paste. And they're going to have to use it because they have no other option. And anyone who says, I don't believe that it can make a difference. So what? It is the only thing that you can use at population level that is almost completely safe. What have you got to lose? Or are you so tied up in your thinking and understanding of what you think science is that you would rather people to die than to accept that, oh my goodness, this may be the only way out. That's where we are now. And let me tell you, anybody at this point who is just, well, blase, well, it's okay, we don't have, and they, they are not interested in you and your health. This is pretty serious. And so if leaders are not putting in place a risk assessment and a strategy that should take into consideration exactly what he's talking about, which is a highly virulent Omicron variant, they are not acting in your best interest. And this is not the time to care about who is upset. This is serious stuff. Based on what Gert has said, and after going through it in detail, so as I said, please go and look at our review as we try to break down all the steps and all the stages with Rob. Very useful, very valuable. As we looked at the clinical implications, I came to the conclusion at the end that, oh my goodness, this is going to be horrific, and I can't see easily a way out of it. So even though I still hope and pray that Gert is wrong, the science suggests that we are almost at this point. If we are at this point, and as I said, clinically, this is already occurring, it's just in a small number. When this hits a big number, there is very little leeway at that point to make a difference. We've got to try and make a difference now. We've got to have a risk assessment now. Raise awareness. Talk to people about it. It doesn't matter if they ignore you. Nobody would have believed COVID-19 in February 2020. Uh, in February 2020, if you told somebody about what was going to happen, they would never believe you. They'd never believe lockdowns. They'd never believe the whole world would shut down. They'd never believe so many people would die. They just would not believe it. In the same way, you cannot believe what Gert is seeing. And frighteningly, I think he may still be right. As I said, let's hope he's wrong. But let's be prepared because we definitely need solutions. Have a great evening.